going to work for Hey, it works. Fantastic. OK, first of all, I want to say that thank you very much. It's my first time in Greece. I feel extremely happy. There's something interesting. Dave, David was talking about how he feels European. Fuck you. You bring him to a football match, and he says it's boring. You're not European, that's for sure. But I'm very happy to be here. Uh, first time in Greece, first time in Athens. I, I just came from London, so it's beautiful to see all of this color around the room. You know, when you go in London, everyone is gray, and the only color you see are some yellow socks that someone brings around. OK, so thank you very much. And again, I was going to do the joke of the girls, but instead of doing the women joke, I'll tell you, the AC guy, please, can you switch the AC guy? The girls are freezing. OK? <laughs> so uh, my name is Alex, and today we're going to talk about a little bit more of an abstract thing. OK, we've been talking about how hard it is to do startups, how hard it is to do shit in Greece, I'm your brother, guys. Okay, your country's going down, Spain is going after. So, pride, okay? Pride here. But the thing is that we keep looking too much, as David said, to the local part. And uh, when you travel as much as I do, when you talk with as many people as I do, you start seeing what I call emerging patterns globally. So I don't think, I, I, I don't know who I was talking to before, but I said something like, yeah, when you compare two countries like the US and Europe, and then I realized, well, Europe is not a country, but for, for me, it's like a country. You know, I keep traveling all around the place, and uh, each country is for me a province, okay? Spain is a province, Greece is a province, the UK is a province. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how this kind of connects on a global level, and how we should actually think about this. And I'll ask you a question that I would love to have an answer afterwards you can talk to me. Why is it that I don't see that many Greek startups, that many Greek entrepreneurs outside of Greece? I want to know this. I really want to, you guys think about this and tell me afterwards. So the truth is that right now we live in this uh, massive world of information where it's very easy to get drowned in the noise that is all, over, all around us. The thing is that it's not only noise. The thing is that a lot of people are craving for attention. I talk with a lot of startups, and they have fantastic products. But the real problem is not the products. The real pro problem is not the market. The real problem is not that you don't have enough features. The problem is there's a like gazillion other startups that are doing exactly the same thing or very similar things. That means that if you want to have a space within my iPhone, or, or laptop, or something like that, you need to get my attention. Okay, that's what Jess actually works at. She gets attention for you guys. It's not just the problem with attention. It's the problem of, you know, I'm doing a startup, and it's extremely hard to find good talent. And when I find someone, they actually go away pretty, pretty fast. I have a friend that runs one of the top research labs in the US. He's a Spaniard. And uh, he tells me, we cannot compete with the Googles and the Facebooks. We, we, we pay them. He actually gave me this offer. We pay people 120K a year, and we cannot compete with them. OK, so there's a problem that there's so much noise that it's hard to find this thing. A lot of people try to fix this with what, what I call brute force attacks, which is I'll get um, Someone said it before, I, I'll get MailChimp, and I'll start sending emails to everyone. OK, that doesn't work. That just annoys the shit out of everyone, including yourself. Then you have what everyone knows, you know, the TechCrunch effect. Uh, so I work with the media. I'm editor for The Kernel magazine out of the UK. I've been uh, writing for TechCrunch uh, Europe. I was just yesterday having dinner with the editor of TechCrunch US. And there's a lot of startups that keep thinking that making it to TechCrunch is the way to go. Well, that's very myopic. This is the real thing. This is what really happens when you go to TechCrunch. This is real data from a Spanish company. That's what you get. And hey, you know, it looks nice in the graph, but it doesn't convert to users. That's not what you're looking after. Other people, when they're search, searching for jobs, they keep using things like monster.com. Okay? In every country, you have the local version of this. 
And well, you know, David is a recruiter. How well does this shit work? It doesn't. When you get to a level that you really need very specific talent, this doesn't work. It all comes to a, a notion which is now information propagates around the world extremely fast. Yesterday I was attending, yesterday I was in London, I was at the web and I was attending this talk by Alec, who is a senior advisor to uh, Hillary Clinton uh, campaign in, in, term, in, in things of innovation. And he was talking about how right now you cannot control, the power is not within the government. The power is within the networks. And he was talking about how you see this emerging networks going on in places like uh, with all this kind of revolutions going out in the Middle East. In the Middle East. Uh, truth is that most people think that they're emergent. Most people think that they're random, but they're neither. They're not emergent and they're not random. There's, there's an effect there and there's a cause as to why those networks, that, that information spreads around. It kind of sustained within time. But the real problem is, how do you actually acquire that first spike? How do you actually get people to read about you and share what you're saying in the net? How do you get yourself that attention that everyone is craving for? This is just from a, a paper that got released very recently. And they said one of the most important predictors of popularity was the source of the article. Readers are likely to be influenced by the news source that disseminates the article. This is no rocket science. I think that everyone knows that if you have a true source, I mean, someone that has authority, people will reshare this stuff. Uh, this guy's had to do a paper and test this shit. We don't need, okay? I think everyone that's doing this stuff knows this. But it comes to the fact that there's this notion that's called influence. There are people that are more influential than others. And the notion of influence is, is basically influence, of course, when one's, em when one's emotion, opinions, or behaviors are affected by others. We see this all the time. Every time your Facebook friends post stuff, every time a friend of you tells you something, every time uh, the girl you like kind of looks at you, we change our behaviors, okay? We are being influenced by people. When I was doing the research, I realized, I, I didn't even know this, there's, there's a part of marketing that's called influencer marketing. And essentially they say, there's four key points to tapping into this influence network, which is the first one, duh, it, uh, identifying the influencers. The second one is doing marketing to influencers, marketing through influencers, and marketing with influencers. To be honest, I think that's bullshit, okay? That's what a lot of PR companies are trying to do. That's what a lot of people are trying to do manually, and it's not working. It's just annoying the fucking shit of me and my colleagues, okay? Because you cannot go to someone and market to the influencer. That means that you want to sell me, sh sell me shit that I don't want. Marketing through influencers, that never happens. It's either the first one or the last one. And finally, marketing with the influencers, I don't want to sell your shit again. So there's a very fine line between doing marketing and what I call influencing the influencers. This, this kind of thought really started, uh, well, I've been doing this for uh, quite some time, but it started, I started thinking about this recently. I have a good friend that his job description is changing government. And when you meet him, he goes like, yeah, you know, I change governments. And you go like, that's the coolest job description ever. Uh, and it actually, he does that. And when you sit down and listen to him, how he does these things, it's mind blowing. You know the typical idea we have of these people that like sit in the shadow and they kind of do crazy stuff and then things happen and the government is out? Like kind of CIA secret ops kind of shit? Well, it, it, it is real, and they don't have guns. They have Facebook, okay? And this guy got me thinking, there's this, this is a TV show, it's very recent. How many of you actually know this TV show? Raise your hand. How many, you've seen the show? Do you like it? Do you like it? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a pretty, I, I actually hate the shit out of Kafer Sutherland, okay? I have to say that. But the actual show is actually pretty good. And there's this notion that uh, the world is connected. And well, the whole story is pretty long, but it got me thinking, 
when I was talking with my friend, like this, my friend sees these connections. My friend is able to see these connections on a global scale, and he's able to influence this network on a massive scale to make change happen. So I started thinking about this, and I said, like, well, you know what? I'm already seeing this. I'm already seeing that if you're able to tap into these influence networks globally, you can change things. I was talking with someone before, uh, talking about how local we keep thinking. You know, a lot of countries keep thinking about local politics. Truth is, real change is happening at a, at a much larger scale. And we're talking, we, someone mentioned before, London Tech Hub versus Berlin Tech Hub. You know what's really happening is that it's not the governments that are actually changing things. It's the people that are telling the other guys in London, like, your city sucks big time because rents are not cheap. And then the Berlin guys are going like, oh, you know, our rents are cheap. And then the British get pissed off and they say like, oh, we need to do something about this. So it's not really the governments actually doing or creating this change. It's really the people. It's the global effect that we're living into that's really making this happen. So the first thing that I started doing when I was thinking about this was locating influencers. So essentially those people that are the ones that will kind of make the final push. Okay, this will be like top editors from tech blogs, uh, top journalists, TV stars, celebrities, I don't care. If you actually start locating these people, and I did this, this example, I took Mike Butcher. Who knows who Mike Butcher is? Raise your hand. Okay, this, this is fucked up, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Butcher is a tech editor for TechCrunch Europe. Okay, so you should know who he is. Anyway, Mike Butcher, I just took this yesterday. And if you analyze who Mike Butcher is actually talking, and you start backtracking his network, you see something interesting. So the first person he's answering is, is Nero, who is Milo, who's actually my boss. He's the chief editor at the Colonel. Then he's talking to someone that's called Brian, that I have no fucking idea who he is or she is. And, uh, but anyway, it's interesting that he's talking to these people. I'm actually able to backtrack who, he has, who he's being influenced by. Then it's interesting to see who is he retweeting, who he thinks that, that, who he's reading and he thinks that's important enough to reshare. When you, when you actually start backtracking, the last one is actually interesting, uh, down at the bottom. Elizabeth Barley, she's, uh, she's the uh, co-founder of Tech Hub. Okay, and, and they, they basically are co-founders and they work together. So it actually, just with this screenshot, I took this yesterday, just with this screenshot, and I can tell you because I know Mike, I know he's influenced by Milo, and I know he's extremely influenced also by Elizabeth. So just by seeing this, I'm able to tap into who is actually influencing what Mike is seeing. When you start doing this on a global scale, when you start scaling out these influencers and start analyzing their network, you actually see something interesting. The first of all is that influence networks are local. I know this is like really stupid, you know, but when you actually map them, you realize that some, our networks, the people that influence us, are people that we actually know physically in the real world. That means that there's a very high correlation between me knowing you and us living within the same area. And I don't know where, there are no pictures there, but uh, that was New York and this was Paris, okay? Just imagine it. The thing is that when you start mapping this and keep going further, you realize that these networks of influencers depend on the time zone. So depending on the time of the day that you are, it really depends, my influence network changes. Okay, so if I live in the West Coast, my influence network is not just my local people, but the whole people living in that time zone. The same happened with the West Coast, and the same happens with places like Europe. So there's this notion that, hey, you know, we want to influence the influencers, but you need to understand that information propagates through different time zones, and you actually can map and see this stuff. So you actually need to locate what I call the time zone connectors. This is people that live in a freaking plane. 
Okay, essentially when you go to the US, everyone that's been there, they recognize that there's only three places to live in the US, which is the East Coast, the West Coast, and the plain in between. Okay, there's nothing else in the US. So you need to find these time zone connectors, and they exist. There's people that are continuously talking normally, and this is, if you don't know it by heart, like around between 5 p.m. here in Europe and 7 p.m. in Europe is the best time if you want to bridge both continents because it's when both continents are actually awake and they talk to each other. So this time some connectors are the ones that at those times are actually pushing and pulling information from one side to the other one. This influence networks are actually time sensitive. My influence network is not the same in the morning when Europe is awaking and the US is, is sleeping than in the afternoon. I was talking with a friend and he said like, no, it is true. You know, in the morning I talk with Europe and in the afternoon I talk with Japan. So in the afternoon I push information from one influence network to the other one, to, uh, to the other extreme of the globe. I don't know if you start seeing this, what I'm trying to see, say here. I'm talking about people that are capable of moving information across the globe in 24 hours and make change happen. The only constant, and this is very, let's say, Asian kind of thinking, is, is, the ch is change. And in the same way, time affects this influence networks. You cannot map a network of influencers and say, hey, this is going to stay here th like this. It actually changes. It's funny how you actually see that Americans that live in Silicon Valley have this tightly coupled network of people they trust. But when they come to Europe, their influence network is extremely different. They listen to different people. So I always say this, there's some US investors that the best time to talk to them is when they come to Europe. Because they're, influence, they're disconnected from the usual echo chamber and influence network from their own countries. Finally, it's important to know that also this kind of influence networks depend a lot on the topics. Not everyone is influential on the same topics and I won't, I mean, if. Uh, David talks about, I don't know, baseball. I don't give a shit. He doesn't know anything about football either, so I won't listen, listen to him when he talks about that stuff. But anyway, every, every one of us has a different topic that we're good at or that people follow us for that reason. So my goal here, and I'm not inventing this stuff, we're actually coding systems to track this stuff and make it happen is to create what we call the domino effect. You probably have heard it in a different way, which is the butterfly effect. How many of you actually know about the butterfly effect? Not the movie, please. <laughs> OK. So a lot of people know about the cow's theory. OK, the butterfly effect is real. It's very real. So what we're trying to build is how do we touch the system? How do we touch these dynamic systems slightly pushing the right keys to create this butterfly effect that will influence in the end the people we want so that our information or what we're trying to achieve will actually be spread out through the whole world. The problem with this kind of butterfly effect is that you know where you start, a tiny change in the initial conditions of the systems make a ripple effect. And so you know where you start, you know where you drop the, the, where you put the drop, but you don't know in the end how is it going to uh, end up being. So I'm trying to uh, push you guys to start thinking in global terms. Start thinking in terms not about your local ecosystem, but actually how you can actually tap into these global networks that exist, that they're very real and that you can actually influence without being someone extremely well known. So in reality, you don't need to talk with Mike Butcher. You don't need to talk with the top investors. You need to talk with guys that follow 200 people, guys that are not that well known, that will actually listen to you. And at the same time, they will prompt this information into their own network. But if you touch enough keys surrounding these influencers, this information will reach them and it will generate an exponential effect on what you're doing. So guys, start thinking about touching the fabric of the world 
again, this is real. I'm not inventing this stuff. We we'll keep working on this. There's a lot of measurements about this stuff. So go out and remember the question I asked you. Why is it that I keep not seeing any Greeks at all on my trips? Keep bumping into French, Germans, British, Americans, Poland, Polish, Croatians, Estonians, very, 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 very few Greeks. So please, start changing this. And as uh, David said, change your attitude. Thank you very much.